Somebody was asking, um, uh, or mentioned, you know, how widespread the Shui Jiao system is in China. Um, whether or not it's, uh, the, 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 say, the, the, the variations from place to place. Um, that's a really good question, uh, and I'll, I can answer it, but it might take me about five, ten minutes to explain everything. <laughs> so I might give, if anybody's got a quick question, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that first, or, or you can be prepared, or I'll try to give like the Cliff Notes version. I'll try to give the Cliff Notes version. How about that? Okay. Um, Shui Jiao, right now, we can consider what we're practicing is the, is the, the latest evolution of Shui Jiao. We like to say that Shui Jiao has been around for 5,000 years, and there has been wrestling around for 5,000 years in China, just like there's been wrestling around forever in many, many, many parts of the world, right? So what we have now that's the most meaningful, I guess, to where we're at right now in Shui Jiao is you have the Qing Dynasty, where they created, um, the Qing Dynasty created what they called the Shen Pu Ying. Now the Shen Pu Ying were like honorary bodyguards, and they were basically just a stable of wrestlers that their whole job was to, was to compete, um, military training, um, you know, take on foreign challengers, and just be as, as, as badass in wrestling as they could possibly be, basically, because the, the, the Qing Dynasty emperors loved Shui Jiao. They loved Shui Jiao mainly because they were Manchurian, and the Manchurians loved the Mongols. I'm oversimplifying, right? I'm not a historian, right? But, but um, and the Mongols loved wrestling, okay? So you had this period in time where Beijing was the center of Shui Jiao, and you had a, it was during this time when the most characteristic parts of Shui Jiao started to evolve. The, um, the use of the jacket, the, the development of solo training tools, the, the development of all of the um, uh, equipment training, the development of, of grip fighting strategies, and the culture of Shui Jiao started to, started to sort of evolve, right? Um, and it also began to assimilate wrestling styles and techniques from all over China, because there are a lot of minority wrestling styles throughout China. The, the most well-known is obviously uh, Mongolian Bok, they incorporated a lot of techniques from there, but then you also have the Manchurian Buku, you have Xinjiang wrestling, you have the Hui minority, you have Tibetan wrestling, you have belt wrestling down in the south of China, you have uh, Shanxi Naoyang wrestling, which is the, which is the jacket, jacket list, which are known for their leg takedowns. So basically, all of these styles of wrestling began to be assimilated into Shui Jiao because it, it was the it was Beijing was the center of wrestling, right? So people would come and practice, right? And that's and began to assimilate all these techniques because whatever would work, whatever you could use to be effective, they would bring it in because it was all about who was the best, right? So you had this throughout the Qing Dynasty, then you had the fall of the Qing Dynasty, and you had a whole bunch of unemployed wrestlers, basically, right? And they uh, began to then spread out from Beijing returning to places such as um, Tianjin and Hebei specifically, but also some further afield like Xi'an and uh, uh, Shanghai and areas like this, and began to assimilate with the like, local martial culture of those areas. So for example, in Hebei, you have a lot of Xingyi, you have a lot of long fist kind of stuff. And so, the, so in Tianjin, you have the martial arts that are, that are uh, popular over there, and then, and, then, and then Beijing, you know, was where, it was where it came from originally, right? So you had this sort of period of time between the fall of the Qing dynasty and the beginning of the, let's say, the communist period, and specifically when the government put Shui Jiao into the national games, okay? The national games, which were in the beginning, um, you know, China didn't take part in any of the Olympics. They just did their own thing. So they had their own like national games, Olympics that they did. I can't remember if it was every two years or every four years. I can't remember, but they, four years. So they did every four years, and um, they put and Shui Jiao was part of it, right? Along with the, some other sports that were important to the Chinese people. So what you had is you had this small period of time between the fall of the, the Qing Dynasty and the, when it was put in the national games, where Shui Jiao started to spread a little bit and take on a little bit of the, the characteristics of each of these places. Long Fist, and like, Hub, like Xingyi Shui, or, no, sorry, uh, Hebei Shui Jiao is known for big movement. You know, 
they developed, during this period, they developed these like standing postures and like these like sim simplified form movements and stuff. And then um, Tianjin was known for being a little brutal. So their, their, their stuff was really focused on like, you know, boom, like explosive big movements, you know? And then um, I guess you could say that uh, the Beijing style stayed maybe closer to the shampooing, but it also did take on certain characteristics. Beijing people, I'd like to say that they're not as big as people from Hebei and Tianjin. They're a, they're a smaller people, so they have to focus a lot on the technical aspects and the, and the training and the grip fighting, which is why the Beijing style is known for those things. And so then, it's, it, during that little small window, it's kind of drifting apart, right? Like, because they're, they're going to these different places. And you have some very famous figures from this time. Um, you have uh, Bao Sar from Beijing. You have the three big Zhangs from Tianjin. You have uh, Chang Dongsheng from Hebei, right? These kind of big characters who were, who were like representing this era. But then when it got into the national games, all of a sudden it's being, uh, it's, it's big time, right? Now you have to compete, use what works. There's more competitions going on. And so the style drifted back in. It didn't go very far, far apart, right? But it drifted back in to now in, within Beijing, or not within, within China, the, the, the styles are very similar. Like you wouldn't say that Tianjin style is different from Hebei style, which is, and different necessarily from Beijing style. They train the same techniques, they do the same solo moves, they have the same grip, fi like grip fighting techniques. What is different is like the, the flavor, right? Um, like, you know, like the focus, where you put the focus, how you focus on the principles, right? And then you're going to get those differences from, obviously, from teacher to teacher to teacher, how deeply they know their stuff, right? Because you have a, um, outside of uh, Beijing, you have the sports universities, which adopted Shuai Jiao training. And the sports universities train it at a very high level and are very, very good, but they, uh, they obviously they're relying a lot on um, the physical attributes of the practice. But then you still have in places like Beijing, um, you know, uh, a lot of old school teachers who have been training, like, you know, whose parents or grandparents were in the shampooing, you know, and, and like are still teaching it that way versus the sports school way. And so right now, uh, it was, I think in the, I can't remember, uh, maybe somebody will know, when they took Shuai Jiao out of the national games, but they took it out of the national games, I think in the late 80s or early 90s, I think. And once they took it out of the national games in favor of more Olympic sports, right, then the amount of people that were practicing Shuai Jiao in China decreased a lot, right? because it was no longer in the national games, but the level of people kept going on and on and on and on because um, um, it's widely accepted right now that, that the best Shuai Jiao people to ever exist, exist now. So the art is still evolving and developing, which I think is pretty awesome because how many, how many martial arts can you, right, traditional martial arts can you say that about, right? Now, um, now there's obviously if it, if it it's too much of a focus on the sports side, then you might, uh, some of the traditional training might fade, like kind of get lost a little bit, but um, I don't think it will. Um, like there's a, a, our school, when I was in Beijing, Beijing, we were part of the Beijing Shuai Jiao Club Association, which was a, a bunch of the traditional Shuai Jiao clubs. We formed a, an association of all the schools to, pr to, to practice together, to do tournaments together, in sort of opposition of the sports schools. You know, not anything bad about the sports schools. I mean, we would, you know, have matches against them and stuff, but to try to maintain the art for the sake of the art, not simply for get somebody who's really good and can go win something, you know? And, um, and so that being said, like there's still a, not a lot of people that are practicing Shuai Jiao, and uh, even within China or without, outside of China, um, uh, but the, the level is still very high. They're still very high and still people very, very passionate about it. And really, you know, the biggest, uh, as far as like the mainland style of Shuai Jiao, there's almost nobody, 
right? The, the most common type of shuai jiao that's being taught outside of China is the, comes from the, the, the Baoding system, which is not really the Baoding China system. It's the Baoding Taiwan system that comes via Taiwan. And, um, and so that's the biggest sort of group that's practicing out of it, but it's quite removed from the mainland style. That, so I, I tend to tell people that Hebei, Beijing, and uh, Tianjin are really, you, can't, you couldn't say they're not, they're, you couldn't say that they were really different styles, more, not like Choi Foot is a different style from, uh, you know, praying mantis, right? Those are different styles. They're more just like different flavors. But the, but the, the, the Taiwanese Baoding style um, does have a very different system of training from what we do um, as their actual style. Now, some of the people are starting to incorporate some of the mainland practice and kind of fold it in, which is good. Um, but so I, I do sometimes consider that a different style of shuai jiao because the training, like, because, you know, the training is different. The, the, um, of course, they're still working on the same throws, so, you know, but just like, but the thing is too, right? If you're, whatever style of martial art you're doing, you're working on punching, kicking, <laughs> takedowns, and joint locks, right? So you're still working on the same stuff too, right? So, so it's the same thing. Um, so that's my, that's my uh, long answer on um, the development of Shuai Zhou, you know, and um, based upon, you know, my experience living there, talking with people, um, you know, talking to the old school guys and, and just kind of, um, you know, living it for a while and getting it from the inside. And I, I, I think I, I must, I probably take it for granted that people don't un know that and understand that history because that was all, that's always been my history of Shuai Zhou. You're like, you know, I've kind of always been in it, so. Um, but it's a very interesting question. Um, Shuai Jiao is known and with, is very, very, very well respected within China. Very, very well respected within China. Like, um, usually, you know, like if, you, if you've ever been to China and you go to the park and you're practicing martial arts, people will come up to you and like usually Chinese people come up to you and be like, you know, tell you you're doing something wrong, you know? Usually always have to, usually the only thing you have to do is tell them you practice Shuai Jiao and they'll walk away. <laughs> <laughs> because there's like, uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna go, you know, like because because it's it's you know uh, it's known for you don't mess around, you know, like you if you're practicing shuai jiao, you you're not messing around, like you know what you're doing, you know, there's there's none of this like your shoulders are too tense and you're you know you have to uh, press your right pinky toe down to make the stance perfect and you're just like no, I'll just let's see if you can throw me, you know. And so uh, it's very, very well respected um, within China. So um, any other questions on anybody? Uh, I guess the only thing I'll say is like, um, I am going to be launching next year uh, an instructor training program. Um, it's been something I've been thinking about for a while. Uh, we've, been, we've had an instructor training program going on in, in Greece for I guess like five, six years now, um, very successfully. And um, it, I think I just kind of, um, I always knew eventually I, was, I would start one here. And, um, and so I am going to be doing that starting sometime in the, the new year, probably February or March. I'll probably launch that. Um, so there'll be a lot more information coming about that. Um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff or just more seminars, you could always just send me a message or, or go on our, our website and, and, and log in and sign in, you know, like you'll, uh, then you'll be on our, our newsletter or my mailing list. Um, it's gonna be a small group. I'm not, uh, it, when I start off, it's, you know, a very, very small group because um, I am, uh, first and foremost is always gonna be quality, right? Making sure that the people who are going through it are gonna have skill and are gonna represent us the way that um, we wanna be represented. Um, and we can begin to just start growing the practice so we get more people training, so. Uh, if anybody's got questions about that, um, I'll, you know, I'll be happy to, uh, you know, they can send me a message or something like that and, and we can talk about it or I'll, or I'll talk about it a little bit more as it gets, as we get closer and there's more stuff. Um, I have the whole thing, the whole thing's already, the, the curriculum and everything's already done. It's just, um, I have to just uh, uh, put it out there <laughs> for people actually so they know what's going on. So anyways. Um, Thanks, guys, for coming. If anybody, like I said, if anybody has any other questions, just let me know. Uh, I'll talk about this forever. Otherwise, um, we can, uh, um, I'll do another one sometime in November. I'm not sure what I'll go over yet, but if anybody has any ideas, um, send me a message if there's something you'd like to see specifically, and I'll, um, 
and I'll uh, I'll see if I can if it works in. So, all right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, huh?